Minka Lesk, The Last White Shield, by Justin D. Hill, beginning partway through Chapter 1, Orbit Over Cadia. As Cadia revolved beneath them, War Master Rise put both hands to the carefully tooled brass railings and leaned forward, his breath misting a little on the chill of the foot-thick glass. He wanted to mark this moment with something momentous yet poetic and memorable, something that could go in his memoirs when, and if, retirement came. As if sensing the moment, the War Master's servitor scribe, an emaciated body with augmented stylus right arm and waist-mounted scroll, shuffled forward, knocking a few other sycophants out of the way. The scribe had come with the title of War Master, and Rise seemed to rather like having his every word taken down for posterity. And now that there were no more Docalian crusade for Rise to lead. It had occurred to many of them that perhaps Rise might not be a war master much longer. Perhaps many were thinking Rise's star was on the wane, and it was time for them to find one that was rising. Rise coughed. <clears throat> to clear his throat. Then his bass baritone rang out. We have returned to our mother in her dime of direst need. There was more, and Benedict thought the War Master's speech could have been better. The War Master finished with a flourish, like an imperial preacher waxing lyrical. Men shall not say that we forgot our duty, nor that we forgot from whence we came. As he spoke, there was a scratch of stylus on vellum, leaving a trail of precise, minuscule, in neatly justified blocks of text. Bendict could not help reading over the scribe's shoulder, while Rise paused as if waiting for it to catch up, letting the words ring through his head. Bendik looked away. The War Master turned, and as if picking him out for not paying due attention, asked, What do you think, Major Bendik? She looks peaceful enough to me, sir, Bendik stammered. Rise smiled indulgently. Yes. Cadia sent out the call, and we have returned. Her need has not been forgotten. The motors of the War Master's bionic arm whined gently as he patted Bendict on the back. No doubt he meant this to be a human gesture, but Bendict did not find the crude press of metal fingers comforting. How long until we disembark? Rise asked the thin, pale officer with a shock of white hair. The officer snapped his heels together. Governor Portlesca has sent his personal barrage to bring you down, War Master. Sacramentum is being loaded onto it as we speak. As soon as it is so down, I will let you know, sir. The freight captain did not think it would be more than a few hours. Sacramentum was Rise's Leviathan, a brass-worked marvel of gunnery and armor and engineering that had spearheaded at least two assaults on the hive world of Alwyn. Good, Rice said. Good. He was one of those men who liked to fill the silences with his own voice. At that moment, one of the adjutants touched the war master's sleeve. The commander of a battalion of Mordeans had arrived on the viewing deck. They were standing by the lift in a formal and uninviting group, waiting for an introduction. Ah. Rice said, as if passing chat with the Mordians was all he wanted in the world, and nodded to them all. Excuse me, gentlemen. 
As Rise's entourage fell away, only one other man remained staring down at Cadia. Bendict took him in through the corner of his eye. He was a first degree general from his epaulette, but he wore combat drab, not dress uniform, and had both hands placed firmly on the brass railing his fist clenching it so tightly that his knuckles had gone white. His boots had not been polished since embarkation. They were mud splattered on the hem of his coat and dried mud stains on his knees as well. That was a detail worthy of note. Generals didn't often kneel, never mind in the mud. Bendict couldn't hold himself back. Excuse me, sir, he ventured. Are you General Creed? The man turned to him. He was broad and bull-necked with close-shaven hair. His eyes were hard and intense, bendit colored. Sorry, I mean, are you the General Creed? The man turned to him. Well, there are four generals named Creed, the last I counted. The other man's eyes had a mischievous twinkle. General Usaka Creed. Yes, I am one of two. His name is Usaka Creed. The other, a fine old man of 320 years, has retired to the training world of Katak. I spent six months with him there, working with Katakans. Good bunch. General Usaka Creed has a particularly good stock of Amasek, though I didn't think much of his stubs. They were a little too refined for me. I'd like something with a little more punch. Creed's mouth almost smiled. As he came first, he has the honor of being plain General Rusaka Creed. Because I am second, I am known as Rusaka E. Creed. He put out a hand and Benedict returned the hard grip. I am honored to meet you, Bendix said. Cream seemed amused by the word. Honored. Yes, Bendix said. We were in the same draft. Where are we now? Yes, I always thought that my career had gone well until I heard you had made general. The first of our draft. To make general by age of 40 years, Terran standard, was a feat almost unheard of. Once he'd gotten over his envy, he'd studied Creed and his tactics, and when they'd been in the same war zone, Bendict had followed Creed's career through his memos and regimental dispatches. How do you feel? I mean, you've been predicting this recall for nearly two years now. Creed seemed impressed, but there was no joy for him in being right. I have. You're right. It would have been better if the recall had started two years earlier. And you were demoted for your troubles, only pending an investigation. Rise, should I say war master wise, stuck by me. Is that because you saved the day on Relion 5? Creed laughed. <laughs> his breath smelled faintly of Amasek. Creed was also famous for his prodigious appetite for the bottle. That's probably half the reason. The other half is rise is no fool. 
There was a moment's pause, and Creed took in Ben Dick's uniform and regimental badge. You must be Major Isaiah Bendict of the Cadian 101st. Twice awarded the Violers Unit Citation. You have one of the most highly decorated tank regiments in the whole of Cadia. Between you, your crew has won six steel crosses, four steel killer, and the Order of the Eagle's Claw. Bendik's cheeks colored and he didn't know what to say. Well, yes, sir. My regiment prides itself on its service to the Golden Throne. The smell of Amoset grew stronger as Creed leaned in and spoke to Bendik in a low, confidential tone. Did you ever think you would make it back to Cadia alive? Bendik knew the statistics as well as any other. Half of all able-bodied Cadians left the planet to fight across the Imperium of Man, but fewer than one in a thousand of those ever returned. He barely needed to think. Never. You? Creed pursed his lips, and his knuckles whitened again. Night was falling on Cadia, and the eye of terror was starting to glow. There was a long pause. Creed smiled. Oh, I have always known that I would come back. Bendig did not know how to answer that. He looked down at their homeworld, gray and blue in the half-light of her sun. And you really think Cadia is in danger? The utmost danger. Creed's nostrils flared. The whole sector has been under attack for years. Plague. Treachery. Heresy. We see all these proud defenses. But Cadia is like us. Whose walls have never already been undermined. Bendik was lost for words again. They both looked up into the viewing dome above their heads. In the darkness of space, they could see the turret lights of the orbital defenses, floating gun rigs, and the bright engine flares of patrolling frigates and the stub-nosed defense monitors. You really think so? I know so. Creed smiled humorlessly. His eyes flickered briefly across the room where the rather embarrassed-looking Rise was trying to explain a joke to the Mordian commander. Our enemies have planned for this for a thousand years, maybe more, and we have grown complacent. Look, Rise is more interested in little pleasantries with those dreadful Mordians than planning for war. Cadian High Command is full of men like him. They have no idea how present the threat is. Even the High Lords of Terra suspect little, I guess. The Cadian Gate is in utmost danger, and it is up to us, honest men like you and me, to ensure that she does not fall. Cadia cannot fall. She will not fall. There was a long pause. Vendit felt flattered by the word, us. But he was shaken by the ominous warnings. What can we do? We shall fight like bastards, Creed said. And we have to be more devious than our foes. Vendit smiled. Is that possible? Life in the God has taught me three things, Creed said. Endurance, grit, and the understanding that faith and courage and good leadership make anything possible. I hope you're right. 
Creed gave him a long look and leaned in once more. When I was young, my drill sergeant had a favorite saying. What is that? Hope, Creed said, is the first step on the road to disappointment. Hey friend, it's me, the Ebony Otaku, the well-rounded nerd. I've really started diving into reading Minka Lusk, and I'm very interested in this story right now. I had to put Fabius Bile down, as great as he is, because you know how I feel about chaos. Um, but there are not, as far as I've been exposed to, many female-centric lead stories. Now, let's be clear about the Warhammer universe. If you are looking for diversity, inclusion, and equality, Warhammer is for you. <laughs> be it in universe lore or be it in the tabletop game, all can be willing sacrifices to the Golden Throne. May the Emperor's spirit live and guide us through the Astronomicon. His spirits be praised. And every living being in the cosmos can be fodder for the ruinous powers. But seriously, um, one of the reasons I love Warhammer so much is because it is just naturally inclusive. In the future, there is only war. And everyone in the future has to be prepared for war to either come to them or for them to go to war. And when we say everyone, we mean everyone. Men, women, children, soldiers, artists, mechanics, doctors, doesn't matter. Everyone is always living on the precipice of impending doom in the universe of Warhammer. Whether it's 30k, 40k, or fantasy, it, that's the whole point. Uh, between the Black Library, which is the lore side, and then Games Workshop and Citadel, which is, you know, the tabletop gaming side, it is all about war <laughs> and making war. Uh, but why the wars are made is what's more important. And what I'm really finding interesting about this story is because the central character is female. We haven't gotten to her yet as far as me reading. We will. Um, but it, the, she actually is the very beginning of the book. So this world, Cadia, where the action is taking place right now, is very unique. This world sits on the edge of our known galaxy, the human's known galaxy, and it faces directly up at the star maelstrom, the Eye of Terror. Incidentally, Perturabo is the one who named the star maelstrom the Eye of Terror um, when he was out, you know, putting around with Fulgrim, and Fulgrim decided to be the Angel Exterminatus. Such a great book. Um, I think I've read the Angel Exterminatus like 15 times. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Um, but... That is a rip, a tear, a hurricane in space, if you will. Only, you know, it's a hurricane the size of Jupiter. <laughs> Where the denizens of chaos of the warp can freely just in and out. Uh, before the star maelstrom showed up, you had to like intentionally drop it into the warp. It just didn't, didn't usually manifest when somebody was out there summoning something from somewhere. Um, the denizens of the warp... And why I am, um, you know, kind of pro-chaos is they were just hanging out. You know, chaos is just being chaos. I would call them a neutral evil. Maybe a chaotic evil, but mostly a neutral evil. Because from their perspective, they were just in their living room being chaotic. And then the emperor, ugh, that was me kicking. The emperor kicked in their door <laughs> and exposed them to humanity. Um... And all Chaos saw was what Chaos needs to see, is that there was more fodder for their fun in the humans. I mean, the Emperor caused all of his own problems, let's be clear, like most parents do. I can't believe my kid turned out this way. Really? Let us examine those four, first 18 years of the child's life. You can't figure out how they turned out that way. I'm done. Um, <laughs> but with all that being said, Cadia is so unique. Because it sits on the edge of the abyss, it is in the direct line of chaos coming out. Particularly, it is a planet of interest to abandon the despoiler. 
a little bit of a history lesson before we go back to Cadia. Abaddon the Despoiler, words, Abaddon the Despoiler, was was one of the four members of Horace's uh, Morning Vol, which basically was his cabinet, or if, or as Abraham Lincoln would say, his kitchen cabinet. They were his closest advisors um, out of his commanders in his Space Marine Legion, uh, the Luna Wolves, before they became the Sons of Horus. And, you know, Horus went all, you know, horus and heresy. <laughs> so there were four members of that group. There was um, Horus Aximond, who was also called Little Horus because he looked just like Horus. Anyone in the Legion whose gene seed made them look like Horus, they got to be called Little Hori. Uh, is that a word? It is now. If you can say it, it's a word. Um, Bops in the Dictionary. If that book falls off this armrest one more time, <laughs> I'm just going to let it stay there now. Um, so Horace Aximond, Ezekiel Abaddon, who would become Abaddon the Despoiler. Um, I mean, his last name is that of a demon. That's how writing works, y'all. Just people who are all like, they weren't evil yet. That's how writing works. There are clues always. You name a character after a mythic demon, he's going to be evil. Um, so Horace Aximond, Ezekiel Abaddon, Garviel Loken, my personal favorite member, and then um, Tarek Trigadon. So the Mordenval, when Horus revealed that he was going to betray the Emperor, he fell to Nurgle under the Anathame. All that mess happened. Eh, Nurgle. Um, the Mordenval was split in half. Little Horus and Abaddon went on the side of Chaos, and then Trigadon and Loken they went the other way and they were pro-emperor. Uh, if you get to the fourth book in the Horus Heresy, which never was supposed to exist, by the way, they were going to limit the Horus Heresy to three books and keep it pushing. And then everybody loved it and they just kept writing and kept writing and kept writing. And I'm here for it because I love me some lore. Um, but if you read Flight of the Eisenstein, which is the fourth book in the Horus Heresy series, you get to learn a lot about what happened to those two after the the drop site massacre when Horus unleashes a virus bomb on a planet to wipe out a whole bunch of loyalist space marines. It's basically loyalist space marines versus Horus and his Chaos Legion space marines. <clears throat> and um, he takes out a whole bunch of his own with the virus bomb as well. There's Titans involved. There there's Emperor's children. There there's just everybody. If there's Ultramarines, everybody down there. Everybody's there. <laughs> you know. Um, and then you're kind of left hanging, thinking that Loken and Turgadon didn't make it through. Loken makes it. Um, and then we actually see a, a frigate called the Eisenstein break away from all of that fighting with some loyalist space marines and humans on board, make a break blind through the war because there's no Astronomicon yet because the Emperor's still, you know, being the Emperor. There's no Astronomicon until the Emperor's, you know, on the Golden Throne. Um, so they have seers who can help get them through. Um, the warp, but they fly into the warp blind, trying to beat a path to Terra to warn uh, the Emperor, uh, your boy Horus, your son, done lost all his cookies out there in space, and he is coming for you. <laughs> and he's coming for all of us, and he's bringing space marines with him, and we're humans, and we can't space marine. And it's really sad because they are greeted on Earth by Malkador the Sigilite in the end of the Flight of the Eisenstein, is actually the beginning of the Inquisition. Eisenstein hears their story. There's another in-between story in there that I can't remember the name of. Um, but he actually sends some of these folks that come to him with this story of Horus's treachery. He sends them to the moon on like a half mission. And when they succeed, he's like, okay, I trust you. Inquisition gets founded. That's the short version. Um, but it's actually, it's very interesting to see how all the lore pieces together um, and you find those nuggets of how stuff that we read in 40K, how those seeds were planted in 30K. Just, ah, oh, I love good lore. I love good lore. Um, anywho, but Malkador, the Sigilite, you know, relays that message as the right hand of the Emperor. He tells the Emperor, hey, your, your son Horus done, done lost it out there in space. He in the Lulu land, uh, he all nurgled up. He coming for you. And the Emperor doesn't believe it. Now, have you ever told a parent um, who thinks their child can do no wrong, but their kid's doing all the wrong? And that parent just is like, not my baby. My baby would never. Your baby did. <laughs> your baby ugly. And <laughs> your baby done did the worst of all things. Um, and it's unfortunate. The last of the Horus Heresy has been published. And I'm just now starting to read it. Chris, if you're watching, I'm reading it. We know what happens. 
but this last omnibus tells us how the battle for Terra happened. And there's a scene that I'm not sure I'm ready for, um, but it took Horus in his full demonic chaos state. And even the Emperor seeing his son in that state, he still didn't believe it. The Emperor still believed he could pull Horus back from chaos until he saw Horus battling Sanguinius, the angel, the one with the wings, the most beautiful of the blood angels, Primarch of all the Primarchs, although Fulgrim, to hear him tell it, he's the most beautiful, whatever. Um, but he sees Horus raise Sanguinius over his head and break his back over his knee and kill Sanguinius in an instant. And then... The Emperor believes Horus is a traitor. That took too much. All them planets that is bonding, all that, all that running into Rebute, none of that did it for you. <laughs> Until you saw one of your sons die by the hand of your other son. That's when you believed. Okay. <sighs> but back to the Eye of Terra and Cadia. So we know who Ezekiel Abaddon is now. He, he didn't just jump into chaos. He ascended to full demonhood post-heresy. There are several characters, humans, and when I say human, I mean um, space marine human. They, the metahumans, there you go. So he was one of the space marines who went full demonhood. A lot of them got imbued with chaos, but they didn't become demon princes. They become demon-ish, but not full demon. He went full demon. Um, another one that's notable would be Fabius Bile. Fabius Bile? Fabius Bile is just whatever Fabius Bile is. <laughs> you know, he's just out there biling away trying to be immortal, <laughs> uh, basically. But some of them went all the way. Fulgrim ascended to demon princehood. Not just demonhood, a demon prince. Uh, he became the angel exterminatus. He became a, a demon creature of legend. And Abaddon's about as bad as it gets. If you know the history of the, the mythology of the name Abaddon, that's a fun thing to go look up. Um, but Abaddon is, is a demon of mythology. And uh, he's one who would usher in the apocalypse. Yeah, I know, right? And Abaddon the Despoiler has his two crazy eyeballs set on Cadia. Because Cadia is a military world. Everyone who was born on that planet, man, woman, child, cook, police officer, doctor, teacher, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what you are. Everyone is trained to be ready for the fight that is coming. Once in a while, Abaddon will just hop out of the Ayaterra, attack Cadia, see what their defenses are like, and roll back. Because Cadia breeds soldiers. That's what they do. If you were born on that planet, you are going to die for that planet and and Terra. Period. That's what you do. And the beginning of this book, then I read it it's such a long time ago. I'll, I'll try to link it. I Maybe. If I can figure out how to do that link extra videos thing. But Minka, when she's a young girl, has to pass the same test to see if she has what it takes to become a soldier. For Cadia. And that test is you you take your little seven, six year old kid, you pick them up and hold them up and make them stare into the star maelstrom. They gotta stare at the Eye of Terra for a certain amount of time and not look away. Because that is the ultimate danger that they're all facing. So they all raise every single child on that planet to be a soldier. And when they are 18 years old, they are given their assignment. They're either going to be drafted to go fight off planet. They're going to be drafted to be part of the planetary defense for Cadia. Or they're going to have a job on Cadia. It is not their choice. Obviously, Cadia is making choices on keeping people home. So there can be more Cadians, because <laughs> Bendict, when we first meet him, and that's the point of view we start with, uh, we meet Minka in the prologue, but the chapter one starts with Bendict, and all of these soldiers from across the galaxy coming back to Cadia. One of the first opening bits of chapter one is the scene of him saying goodbye to his parents. And he has been at war so long that he can't even remember what his parents look like, because parental attachment is not something they are raised to want because all of them are going to die somewhere in space or their own planet but they they don't after they turn 18 and they get drafted they never see their parents again so we start from the point of view of Bendict 
who has gone through the process of being raised to be a soldier, he reminisces about the day that he's called up and he, he gets his posting and his father gets him drunk because that's what good dads do before their boys go off to wall. But his mother and his father, they don't embrace and hug him. They stand like strong, proud Cadian parents sending their son off to do his duty. And then he's gone for 40 years. <laughs> And none of them that go off world to fight in the Emperor's Wars, to fight for Terra all over the galaxy, none of them have any hope of coming home. It's not something they think about. All they think about is, I have to do my duty. I have to fight. We have to win. We have to keep back chaos. We have to, to root out the heretic. Whatever it takes, the, Emperor, the Imperium of Man must stand. And that's the world that Bendict is raised in. And he has a great career. And he even gets to meet his idol, the Sakaar Creed, one of the great generals, modern generals. And they happen to be around the same age. Only one has gone way further in their military career than the other has. It happens. We have a war master, which incidentally, that title war master, yes, Horus is the war master. But you got to think of that like, you know, a, a, a title for the time being, you know, like prince. How many princes are there? Okay. There can be more than one. Horus was the war master of oh, everybody. You know, they're, they're general, they're major general. <laughs> you know, so there can be more than one war master. But the current war master, of which there he's several, um, but the current war master, Rise, he's an older gentleman. He's gotten his glory. Um, and Creed is the one who led us, who, who started that, um, what is it, the... Uh, the, the urgency to come back to Cadia, spreading the word across the galaxy, we, we got to get back to Cadia. Because Abaddon, the despoiler, has his eyes set on Cadia, but not just in a paltry attack anymore. He is gearing up to bring everything he has out of the Ayaterra and take Cadia. And if he can take Cadia, it lays open the door to the rest of the galaxy. So Creed has talked their military forces into doing their duty. Anyone who goes out into the stars never hopes to come home, but the one opportunity they will ever have to come back is to fight for Cadia should she be under attack directly by a bad the despoiler and the denizens of Gaos trying to destroy the planet. So they are all coming back. And Creed and Bendict have this moment where they recognize each other's talents as military personnel. Their lives have taken completely different paths within the military. Ball roads lead to home. They have come home to defend their homeland. And that's what we're set up for now in Minkalesque. I've, I've gotten to Minka already and I like her. I cannot wait to introduce her as a character to all of you. Um, but I want to just take some more time and keep reading and get through the first book in the omnibus uh, before I come back and read some more. Um, I do like the way that Justin D. Hill writes 100%. He's a good writer. We all stand Dan Abnett. Um, no, look, hey, 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 uh, Black Library, nobody wants an AI-generated book, okay? Okay. Um, we love our writers. Um, his characters feel very real and rooted, and they feel like they have the true persona of people who have been beaten down battle after battle after battle but they still have it in them to fight because they believe in the fight they believe in what they're fighting for and that's one of the things I love about Warhammer so much is anyone can fight everyone has a purpose everyone can be useful and I joke about it you can die for the emperor you can die for chaos y'all that's ultimate equality <laughs> okay everybody can die for somebody in Warhammer but where Cadia stands out unique is exemplifying that everyone has a purpose. And if you don't know what your purpose is, don't worry about it. We're going to take care of that. We will give you a purpose if you don't know what your purpose is. <laughs> All right. And it's a great adventure that we're going to go on with these characters. And I cannot wait to bring more of these characters to you. But that's going to be it for now. Because the next Warhammer video that I'm going to record is going to be cracking open my heresy box. Because I've got, 
a heresy event in June and homegirl needs a thousand points <laughs> by then. So she's got to get that paint factory going. All right. So, um, I'm really enjoying doing this. I've, my channel's starting to actually kick off. It feels like, so that's kind of fun. Um, and, um, it's weird because I, I do record ahead because of my job. So if I get free time or um, I, I traveling and stuff like that, I, I will record like videos back to back to back. So when you see this and like my feelings in the moment, you know, they may be a month old <laughs> by, by the time you see it. Uh, but just know that I appreciate you. Um, and uh, let's just keep growing the channel together. So as always, please like, comment and subscribe and I will see you in the next one.